All right, well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining our third fireside chat. Um, last time we did one of these chats, we were literally in what we would call the belly of the beast. Um, the markets were selling off. It was the middle of March, pretty close to the bottom. And it just felt so, so chaotic. And I don't know about you, Bob, but I feel like I've lived about uh, 100 lives. Since yeah, well, you know, last, the last chat we did, right, the market was near its bottom. Um, which looks like it might be the bottom for the correction. But, you know, I just got back from Florida um, and I'm in Ocean City in uh, where Ryan's been working from. So he's back up in Manhattan. But I'll tell you, it's, a, it's really different. Um, and Florida's been open for a little while. You know, they opened their restaurants, you know, a couple of weeks ago to, you know, 25% capacity. You know, they had their, their food stores open just like everybody else, right? They had Costco was open, food stores. And I kept scratching my head saying, well, why am I safe to go to Costco? Uh, where I'm safe, the people that work there are safe, the people who are shopping there are safe, the suppliers are safe, but I'm not safe going to Best Buy. It didn't make any sense to me. Um, and so when Florida did start to open things up, everybody followed the uh, procedures, right? They, they, they social distanced, they wore, you know, gloves and masks. And, um, and you know, it looks like so far there hasn't been a, a new outbreak of coronavirus in, in places like Florida, other places that opened earlier. And I see how shut down it is here in Ocean City. I mean, everything's shut down. And I th think, you know, now I feel um, it's, it's a real different feeling here and probably in New York and, and Pennsylvania and some of the other places where you are. Um, not so down in Atlanta and where you are, Mike, but the, um, it's, things are going to start to open up again. And I'll tell you what, it was so nice in the last two weeks in Florida just seeing people smile. Now, the people that you, know, you went to a restaurant or a store, you couldn't see them smile because they had masks on but their face was smiling, you know, their eyes were smiling and people were being really smart about it. So I think that uh, we'll start to see things start to reopen. But, you know, as that's just as an aside, we've got a lot of market stuff to talk about. And uh, so Ryan, why don't we start off with the first question? Yeah, yeah, just as an aside, we don't smile here in New York, so I can't relate to that. <laughs> but uh, so first question comes in from Eric. He writes in, I have a significant amount of money in cash beyond what I need for emergency fund for nine plus months. We use recommend having about six months have not taken any money out of the market since the drops, but have continued to slowly add to my account. Where do you recommend investing? My main thought was S&P 500 index monthly contributions and watch it grow over the long term. I know some analysts are expecting another drop, so just stick with the plan, right? Well, let's unpack this a little bit, Bob. I mean, first off, I do like the idea of dollar cost averaging. Um, that's what if you're a client, you're on, the video conference right now, you know, we executed in March. Um, you know, we were adding to the markets when they were down, taking advantage of the fact that we had this big dip and not really knowing when the rebound was going to actually happen. So I like that. I do have some qualms with just owning the S&P 500. You know, Bob, is that really diversification? Is that really the smartest move right now for Eric? Well, the S&P is something that when you watch the lightning news, the news, they talk about the market. They talk, you know, they're basically referring to the Dow, the S&P 500, but you know, I think the one thing that we've learned through this, you know, whole pandemic um, is that diversification works and, um, you know, not every asset class moves in the same direction. So I think the, um, you know, every asset class is cyclical. Uh, one of the reasons why we don't just own the S&P 500, um, when we started paying capital 11 years ago, if you went back the previous 10 years and you were 100% invested in the S&P, what would you guess your return was, Rye, over that 10 year prior period? It was lousy, Bob. It was actually a negative return. So imagine yeah, you that lost money. Money. yeah. So, you know, one thing that I know is that, um, you know, past performance doesn't predict anything. And, you know, I, look, uh, the best part of the S&P 500 has been, have been large growth stocks and we've just made a fortune for everybody and ourselves. Um, you know, it's been a great performer, but we're not going to take all your money and buy large growth stocks while they're already up, right? We've, we're, we're making our money there. Uh, there's other places to make money, and the key is to be diversified. Plenty of opportunity. Um, the other thing is the SP 500, you know, which is driven mostly by the, the large technology stocks. The dividend yields are low, and you know we need income. So you know we're going to get a lot more income out of other parts of our portfolio than we are there. Yeah, so just to, to talk a little more about that, we have a question in from Rocco. He writes in: I've read that only 17% of S and P 500 companies have driven the recent rally and the large majority are struggling. Doesn't this indicate another major dip in key indices as earnings come out for the rest of the year? Well, first off, this is a really important point. All these prognosticators on TV, uh, all these quote unquote experts, um, they've been calling for this double dip 
in the market and the economy. Now, first off, remember, these people did not predict the pandemic or the market was going to sell off the way it did. So how all of a sudden do they have this gifted insight that you and I don't have? Well, first off, they don't really know. And I think what's important to dissect here is the economy and the stock market are not the same thing. Wash, rinse, repeat. The economy and the stock market are not the same thing. The economy and the data about the economy is backwards looking. That's already what's happened. And, you know, we're seeing some terrible numbers. Unemployment rates, um, you know, looking at companies right now trying to stay afloat. But that's not news. We knew that was going to happen. Economists were able to project that relatively accurately. On the flip side, the market is not trading on what's happening today. It trades on future fundamentals. So, you know, earnings this year, who knows what they're going to look like? Nobody really knows. But I'm going to take a wild guess here, Bob. We're talking two years from now. I have to think we're going to be back to probably some sort of normalcy again. And, you know, companies are probably going to have earnings again like they did back at the beginning of the year. So what the stock market's looking at right now is what are things going to look like in the future or future fundamentals? Well, that's a good point, Ryan. It's, um, and here I think it's a big difference, right? 2008, 2009, which wasn't that long ago, um, you know, we had a great recession. I mean, we had a recession. And, you know, this is, and now you're getting numbers that are worse, right? They're getting, and the headlines are, oh my, unemployment, worse since the Great Depression. Uh, this is worse than a recession. This, you know, we're, we're talking depression. Well, this isn't a, a, a self, this is a self-induced, right? This is a government-induced shutdown. So it's a forced recession. Um, you know, it's, it's like everything's in place. You know, I, I think of that, the old neutron bombs, you know, where you drop the bomb and it kills all the people, but all the buildings and everything's there. You know, all they do is turn the switch off um, and everything's in place. So that when they turn the switch back on, you know, we're going to see things really start to recover very quickly, much more quickly than we did in 2008 and 2009. But, you know, if you remember, Rye, back in, in 2009, the market actually bottomed in late 2008. Most stocks bottomed in late 2008. And the actual bottom of the market was March of 2009. And the news was horrible. <laughs> and it got worse. <laughs> yeah, it got worse for like two more years. And this is where we don't want you to make the same mistake again. We saw this mistake in 08 and 09 because the, the market did bottom in March. The economy didn't bottom for another four or five months. Um, and worse, the experts were calling for a double dip recession all the way into 2011, two years mm -hmm. later. Um, so there's no reason the news can't stay bad for a long, long time, but the market's not gonna react to that. It's the other way around. Financial assets move first, the economy recovers second. So it's a really important point because that's the way it normally is. It's not normal if the economy and the market are in sync. 66% um, of the time when you have a downturn in the economy, the market actually goes up during those years. So it's more common for the market to be up and not down um, as the news gets worse. So it's just like an important thing to remember. And, th and then one other thing that we really want to stress to everyone, uh, there's an old expression on Wall Street, it's called don't fight the Fed. That means you know, don't go against the Federal Reserve when they're sending money into the economy. Um, and I want to remind everybody, we had, if not the greatest, one of the greatest economies in the history of the planet, in the US especially, going on just this past February, right? You think about, you know, uh, February, go back 12 months, it was the greatest economy we've ever seen since we've all been alive. Um, and there's no reason we can't go back there, especially since the Federal Reserve just pumped $9 trillion into the economy. $9 trillion with a T. This has never happened before. I mean, we had you know, other stimulus in 08 and 09, every other decline I've ever been through. But now we have the greatest economy ever that didn't need anybody's help at all to become a greatest economy. Now we got $9 trillion worth of stimulus with a Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Powell who said, I will do whatever it takes. Now, when you have a Federal Reserve with that you know, as, your, you know, as your backup, you know, your wingman, all right? You, you know, I'll tell you what, we're, we're only going to see good news. Big surprises going forward are going to be on the upside, um, as far as I can see. Yeah, the, the government and the Fed did not add $9 trillion to the economy for it to, for it to fail. No. <laughs> so I think that's <laughs> probably the big takeaway there. Uh, next question comes in from Bill. He writes in, the conspiracy theorists say we should invest in gold, silver, cryptocurrencies. What is your outlook and what should we invest in? Bob, I know you put your net worth in a crisp cryptocurrencies. Um, your life's never been the same since. You, you've been broke. Uh, well, you know, I've never, I've never been a big fan of, uh, of Bitcoin ever since, you know, Warren Buffett called it something really nasty that, you, you know, you wipe off your shoe. And 
<laughs> and a lot of people don't know this, but you know, Ryan actually did a video. He went into a Starbucks in New York, you know, and, and those lines are long. And he tried to pay his, you know, for his latte with a, with Bitcoin. And, you know, of course, the, 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 wait, the, wait, the waiter didn't know what the heck he was, you know, the clerk didn't know what he was talking about. And he had to get the manager involved. Meanwhile, there's this long line of people, you know, saying nasty things about Ryan going, what, move it along, you know, like, we'll, we'll pay for your coffee. So <laughs> until Bitcoin is actually a currency, we can actually buy things with it. It's not a currency. I don't know what it is. It's just a way for you to lose money as far as I'm concerned. A bunch of millennials in their basement trading it. That's another story altogether. But, you know, talking about gold and silver, um, we like to have a commodity component to your portfolio. If you're a client of ours, we have that. Uh, which would have gold, but we want to have all commodities in there, everything from oil, agriculture, uh, livestock, all those component into the portfolio. And the reason we like that is because it's a hedge. And the one thing, Bob, you just mentioned about this $9 trillion into the economy. Well, you know, one thing we believe, and a lot of economists believe, is eventually you're going to have inflation because we have all this money sloshing around right now. And when that happens, you need to have what we call inflation hedges in your portfolio. So having something like gold, silver, and just a commodity component in general is a great hedge to have in your portfolio, especially if you have inflation. But if it's just a standalone investment, like I'm just going to own gold, pretty lousy investment, Bob, based on history. Well, you know, I always say about gold, there's, there's a couple of things I don't like about it. Number one, it's too heavy to carry around. Uh, number two, it doesn't pay a dividend. And number three, you can't eat it. So um, other than that, you know, I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big you know, gold uh, bug. And uh, basically, it's underperformed the uh, stock market uh, since I've been born. Just a gold watch, Bob, right? Which I don't think you even know. <laughs> That's when, when, when I retire, Ryan, I want a gold watch. And I'm just putting <laughs> you on notice. Good. All right. 20 years from now, we'll talk. So it's good. We got a long <laughs> while to go. Uh, next question comes in from Ryan, not me, another Ryan. Now, what about Terry? What about Terry's there? Uh, oh, excuse question? me. Don't want to forget about Terry. Terry writes in, would you talk about what happens if a company that we may have in our bond portfolio declares bankruptcy? Would that bond be worthless or worth pennies on the dollar? Well, typically in a restructuring, it would be probably more than pennies on a dollar depending, but I think this is a really important point. We work with an institutional manager for all your portfolios if you're a client, meaning they do credit work to make sure you only own the safest bonds in your portfolio. That's true. I mean, we have, um, you know, just to, to give you an example of, the, of our municipal portfolio that most of you own, um, if you think about municipal bonds, they're issued by states, cities, and governments, and states, and, and there's a million issuers. Think about that. One million issuers of municipal bonds. Now, those million issuers, you know, there's, there's credit ratings, and the highest credit rating you basically can get is AAA. There's very few AAA-rated municipal bonds, but um, AA is really the highest quality you can get. And of all those million issuers, there's only 450, 450 issuers that actually get a AA rating. So there's 955 <laughs> you know, thousand issuers of bonds that we don't care about and we'll never own. Um, of the 450 that are AA rated, there's only about 125 that we actually invest your portfolios in. So we study those bonds, our, our institutional managers on those bonds every single day. And, and when you think about a bond, you know, think about a piece of fruit. Now, a piece of fruit, you know, doesn't go from, you know, picked to ripe to rotten overnight, right? It takes a while for it to rot. Um, so when you have a bond that goes bad or, you know, an underlying credit that goes bad, it, it, it takes us it's over a series of time, a period of time. So if we had a bond that goes bad, it'll go below double A in its rating long before it goes bankrupt. So if something in our portfolio goes bankrupt, we'll be out of it years ahead of time. Yeah, that's a good point because one bond we did own back in the earlier 2000s was Puerto Rico. And yep. we were out of Puerto Rico maybe five years before those bankruptcies because to your point, Bob, that didn't happen overnight. It wasn't a surprise to anyone that was in the bond market that was a manager. Um, if you study the balance sheets of these different municipalities, you know, there's a lot of this stuff comes out much earlier than to the point of bankruptcy. And another point, point about that too is we don't like bond funds. If you're a client of ours, you'll never own a bond fund. But if you're not a client of ours, a lot of that low quality paper that we call junk or they call it high yield is kind of a euphemism for junk bonds. Um, that's what you have to worry about with bankruptcies. And if interest rates start going up, which realistically, if the global economy picks up, and we believe it will, rates can start going up. Um, that's going to be a big problem for these bond funds uh, because you don't know what you know, own inside of these and the depreciation on these things is going to be massive. So just something to keep in mind when you're looking at your portfolio. Um, this is why we only own institutional 
bond management with a professional manager who's doing the credit work wouldn't do it any other way. So that's one of my secret indicators, right? Fruit flies. You know, when I see fruit flies on our bonds, uh, I sell them and then we put them in bond funds. And so all those people out there in bond funds buy the crap we get rid of. Bob, you're, you're cruel. Very yes. cruel. Fruit flies, baby. Fruit flies. I like the analogy. Uh, next question comes in from Ryan. Ryan writes in, recently I bought shares of Simon Properties, which is a real estate investment trust, which owns multiple outlets. Do you think this stock will perform well immediately post-market? Will it take some extended amount of time? Also, I increased my exposure to municipal bonds. Um, I have no idea, <laughs> Ryan. That's the thing about when things recover. Um, you know, REITs, we think are a good thing to have as a part of your portfolio. But again, I wouldn't put all my money into real estate investment trusts or anywhere else because the reality is we're not going to know what the best place to be was until it's already happened. Um, you know, we, you don't know what's going to, there's so many different things that can happen with REITs. If interest rates go up, they're interest rate sensitive. They may not do as well. Um, if you see that, you know, a lot of the, the rentals that they have don't go down as much as people think they are, they could recover faster. So the point is, you know, it's unknowable to know what's going to work best first. And that's why we own 10,000 different positions over our different respective indexes. Yeah, that's right, Ryan. I mean, buying one real estate investment trust company is a speculation, is gamble. Um, as opposed to the way we invest in real estate investment trusts, we own a, an index that owns 187 of the greatest companies in that space. And, you know, hey, malls may never recover from this, but, you know, we have companies there like Digital Realty and, and American Towers, you know, that, uh, that are participating in the digital red revolution that's going on in this country. So I don't know which part of the real estate market is going to be the best over the next 10 years, but that'll be the largest holding in our index. So, you know, why take the chance of picking the wrong one? You know, you know I, if I named all 187, uh, could you tell me which one's going to be the best performer in 10 years? I can, but it'll be 10 years from now when I tell you. All right. So, you know, why take that chance? That's why we don't speculate. We're investors. And the other thing is you don't have to be that smart. Um, you know, if you're just. Whoa, hey, well, hey, come on. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Hey, the market's going to figure it out for you. And that's why we like capitalization weighted indexes because the cream's going to rise to the top. And, you know, going back to the S&P 500 example, the five biggest positions in the S&P 500 right now, which all our clients own in their portfolios, are Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google. We didn't have to pick those. They just grew to be so big that they're essentially the biggest position in a lot of your portfolios. Now, Rewind back 12 years ago, the number one position in the S&P 500 was ExxonMobil. And as you know, energy prices have just plummeted over the last decade or so. Um, but we didn't have to make that decision of getting out of that and making sure we we're in big tech. It happens for you. So it's the nice thing about being invested as a diversified investor is the market's going to figure it out for you. The market's smarter than you and me. And that's why 90 to 100% of fund managers underperform the index long term because it's just impossible to gain that. Now, that's a perfect segue ride right, to our next question uh, from Jim, who says, do you think this is a good time to buy oil, oil ETFs or oil stocks? I like it. I like it. Um, a big part of our portfolio is the energy market as well. And this goes back to one of the big things you see on TV right now in these financial people is what are the winners that you can buy right now during the coronavirus or after the coronavirus? It's like a biotech. Um, you know, I go to the grocery store five times a day now. So grocery stocks, no kidding. <laughs> the market already knows that it's already bid it up. So it's okay to buy those things, but you're not getting the best value where you get the best value. And, you know, if your advisor has been calling you and you're a client of ours is we're adding a lot of money to the things that got hit the hardest, like energy, because when things bounce and energy right now, this is exactly what's happening. They have the biggest bounces. So it makes a lot of sense to be buying the things that are really, really out of favor right now. Financials are another example because they're really cheap and they've got a bigger runway to rebound over time. So don't just buy the winners, buying things like energy here, financials here where the dividend's great. They're trading really cheaply. They're going to have a real, this can be a real bang for your buck long term. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, just following, I don't know how many of you follow the price of oil uh, and then we all follow the price of gasoline. Actually, you know, my car, uh, what, what does your car get by the week now, right? You know, what do you get by, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, um, it, it's, we don't measure by, you know, miles per gallon. Now it's, it's, it's weeks per gallon or months per gallon. But, you know, we'll all be driving again and we'll be using gas and, and oil. 
But, you know, if you look at oil, we had that oil contract that, you know, nobody wanted the oil. And the price of oil actually went to a negative $37 a barrel. First time I ever saw that in our, in our lifetime. Um, and since then, now oil's rebounded over $30 a barrel. So, again, it just shows you the cyclicality of all markets. And it's one of the reasons why we're big believers in buying low. You know, whenever, you know, something's out of favor, you know, hey, everybody loves to buy, you know, growth when it's in favor and it's at all-time record highs. And when we tell you, oh, no, we're buying value here, we're buying real estate here, we're buying international, uh, it's because we like to buy low because, you know, every dog has its day and, uh, you know, price matters. And, it's, and, and when things are out of favor, it doesn't stay out of favor. You know, the biggest cure for low prices in my experience has been low prices. So, you know, you want to buy when it's low. It's, it's you know, it's, it, it sounds, uh, it's counterintuitive except for every, and, and to us as investors, except for everything else we do in our life, right? You know, one of the things that I know my bride, you can't wait to get out because she thinks it's going to be tremendous bargains, you know, because the shops have been closed down. She can't wait till the stores open, um, you know, because she likes to buy bargains. Who doesn't? Um, we know mom likes a bargain. That's it. No, we do. Uh, next question comes in from Jason. He writes, and I want to start building passive income. We just did a podcast on that. Check it out, Jason. Primarily using dividend stocks, like the thought process. How would I go about doing this inside an IRA or a Roth IRA? Well, first of all, you know, it's again, you don't want to buy stocks, right? You want to buy a, a portfolio of stocks, an index of stocks, because, you know, here's what just happened. Um, last, last month, we had great companies like Procter & Gamble and Johnson & Johnson and Costco increase their dividend. And they've been increasing their dividend every year now for 60 years. But there are companies that are more cyclical, companies like Boeing, Ford, General Motors, Disney, uh, Royal Dutch Petroleum cut their the Royal Dutch Petroleum paid a dividend since World War II. Cut their dividend, you know. Uh, Las Vegas Sands, right? It makes sense. Nobody's gambling, so you know they can't afford to pay a dividend. So again, stock speculation usually ends in tears. Um, we believe in dividends, but we believe in getting dividends from a diversified portfolio. And again, you want to stick with a well diversified exchange traded fund or index. Uh, large value is the way to go there, Jason. Yeah, and if you just look at our portfolio specifically, I mean, even globally right now, if you look at international dividends, they're higher than most domestic dividends. So there's a lot of great ways to diversify, play that right now. And I, I like your thinking on that. The other part of this question is, if you already have a Roth IRA and are over the maximum yearly income, can I still contribute without penalty? Okay, so yes, if you contribute to a Roth IRA, you have to make under a certain amount of money or you get phased out. Um, if you make over a threshold, there is something called a backdoor Roth IRA, but there's a couple things you need to do to maneuver to make that happen. So Jason, uh, hit me up offline. If you want to talk more about that, I can walk you through that. So there are some ways if you make over the amount, but you have to have some other things in place to do that. And Roth IRAs, if you don't know what that is, it's just a, an investment that where the vehicle grows, money in there grows tax-free, but you can also take it out tax-free, which is a phenomenal mm -hmm. opportunity. We'll talk a little more about tax strategies here um, before the Zoom call here is over. Next question that comes in is, come, is from Michael. He writes in, I'm 57 year old, single male, no kids, no debt. I like no debt. I have 580,000 in my 4.3B and Roth combined. I plan on working nine more years and I'm about 58% equities and 42% fixed income. I contribute 32% of my salary to retirement should I sit tight, stay the course, or move a bit more conservative? What do you think here, Bob? Um, Michael, maybe. Definitely maybe. Just a definite <laughs> maybe. I mean, um, we're, not, we're not about speculation. We're, we're about investing, in, and we're about goal-based asset allocation. So, you know, at 57 years old, age isn't, isn't really a strategy. Or, you know, the old rule of thumb, you take, your, you take 100, you subtract your age, and that's how much you have in equities. You know, these are all rules of thumb that we don't believe apply to anybody. You're a unique individual. You remind me of everybody that comes to our door every week up in Manhattan and in Philly is, you know, you're someone who needs a plan. You need a goal-based asset allocation. Most people take more risk in their portfolio than necessary to achieve their, their goals. And, you know, hey, it's great when markets are going up and risk doesn't feel so bad. But when you get a pandemic and it goes down 35% in five weeks, all of a sudden that risk doesn't feel so good. So, you know, um, it's it what you you're, you're like the perfect candidate for pain capital management and uh whether it should be 58 42 or 50 50 you know really depends on you and you know our projections that we would do for you and uh, michael you're a perfect candidate for pain capital management day to be approach yeah just uh, you know, the way we look at that is kind of reverse engineer it you know we want to look at what your goals are first you got to look at when you i'm assuming 58 or 57 
Um, you're getting closer to retirement. You're thinking about it. So you got to really start to figure out what those things are. And we can help you do that. But that's, that's the whole process is figure out what your goals are first. Then we can go back and look at the portfolio and make sure the portfolio is designed to meet your goals. Call that goal-based investing. Uh, next question comes in from Dennis. I heard that there is a provision in the CARES Act that allows you to roll over money that is in a traditional IRA account into a Roth account. And the taxes that would be due can be spread equally over a three-year period. Is this true? I try to find that out. I don't think it is true. I think you still have to pay the taxes on it. However, if you are over 72 and you have to take a distribution from your IRA every year, but you don't have to this year, by the way, um, and let's say you don't, you can still do a Roth conversion. And a Roth conversion simply is you can take your retirement money, pay the taxes now, put it into that Roth account I just mentioned, and then the money's completely tax-free for the rest of your life, all that growth. This is an awesome strategy because this year, if your balances are down a lot in your retirement accounts, it might be worth paying the taxes now. And you might be in a low tax bracket this year due because of the pandemic. Um, I would absolutely, if you're one of our clients, I'd work with your CPA and one of our financial advisors to put a game plan together around that. But man, Bob, we talk about this all the time. Right now is like the best time to optimize tax strategies. You know, everything from tax swaps, Roth conversions, generating tax-free income. Like this is, this is the time to do it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good reminder too, Ry, that uh, you do not have to take the required mandatory distribution this year. You got a waiver from the IRS. Uh, I just got a call today from a client, just got a letter from Fidelity reminding them how much money they should take out of their IRA, uh, you know, for the required minimum distribution. So, you know, ignore those letters, uh, you know, unless you really want to take the money out and pay the tax this year. Unless I can't think of any reason why you would. You know, we can keep that tax in your portfolio, compounding, and, uh, you know, we revisit this again in November 2021, where we'll do your, you know, required minimum distribution from the IRAs and 401ks. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so money saved in taxes, just as green as any money can make invested. Rinse, wash, repeat. Think about that. That's an important point. Um, all right, we're down to the last couple of questions. I want to go over to the, the sidebar here real quickly. And Ryan writes in, Uber laid off a lot of workforce. Why did that translate into stock rising significantly? Why does this happen in general when stocks rising once companies lay off workers? The reason is because workers are overhead. And if you're firing people, it's one of the harsh realities of the marketplace. That tends to be good because now your profits or your profit margins increase because you have less overhead, if that makes sense. Well, I can see that, uh, you know, Uber would be a, you know, a company where the business isn't really, um, you know, looking that good right now. But again, market looks forward. It looks, it's looking through the valley of, you know, of all the bad news. So, you know, the layoffs, everything. In a lot of cases, you know, we had, I mean, we have record layoffs, rec record unemployment, but these jobs didn't disappear like at every other recession. And, you know, they didn't disappear like they did in the depression. These are furloughs. Think about it as a furlough. So, you know, a good client of ours this past week reopened their business. A hundred people came back, you know, off of unemployment, you know, back on their payroll this past Monday. So the, um, I think the government's done a really good job here, uh, you know, softening the blow through this. Um, and then I think as the economy opens up around the country, like we've seen in other states, then, um, you know, it's going to, the unemployment rate's going to drop very, very rapidly. And, and that's what the market's looking at. It's looking at future earnings, not what's going to happen next week. Yeah, so it's a good point because that, that unemployment number, which is over 20%, is not a real um, number in the sense that I, I think the statistic that came out last week was 75% of Americans that are right now laid off anticipate to get their jobs back. In fact, JP Morgan had a statistic a couple weeks ago that think unemployment will be down to 7% next year, which is still not as good as it was before the recession, but that's a lot better than it is right now, which just gives you an idea how rapidly uh, things can recover. And again, we, what you just said, Bobby, the market's really, really emphasizing it. The market's looking at it. That's what it's telling you. Um, last question, or there's actually two questions left here, is from Richard. He writes in, questions for Ryan and Bob. How do I maintain my purchasing power of my savings when funds charge a 1% fee? Well, I don't know if it's the fund that's charging or if you have an advisor charging you a fee, um, but if you look at it statistically, uh, the S&P 500's done, in any market, it's done about 10% a year over the long term, but the average investor has done less than 5% a year. And that's way over the cost of living, by the way, getting a 10% return, beating inflation. The problem is, as we all know, market has hiccups like we just went through. 
And I believe, you know, having advice, and I think, you know, the proof's in the pudding, but look, the market was down big and we were able to execute, keep our clients invested, add money to the market while it's down. That's the key. Anything we bought in the last couple of weeks, especially in March, you know, the reward on that over the next couple of years, you can't even, you know, that's not going to be a 1% reward. It's going to be like a, a dramatic reward in terms of returns you're going to see when this thing recovers, it's starting to recover. So I think anyone who can give you a game plan and build a game plan for you that you can stick to through thick and thin, your numbers are going to be way better than inflation long term, uh, less whatever fees being charged. You know, through every bull market I've been in, right, it, you know, people become more confident, uh, become, you know, less fearful. And a lot of times uh, the people that we end up as getting, we get a lot more new clients, you know, after a, a correction like we just had um, than we do prior. Because prior, you know, a lot of people were full of, of hubris and they believe that, hey, you know, this is, I'm really good at this. Um, you, know, we, you know, back in, in the 90s, we had people quitting their day job to become day traders. Anybody ever hear about day traders anymore? You know, where'd they go, right? It doesn't work. You know, investing is hard. Investing is very hard and it's very emotional. And um, hey, look, I've been doing this for 46 years. Ryan's my advisor. If I didn't have Ryan, I'd be broke, yeah. you know, because it, you're, that was a genius. I had all my money in Maryland stock, right? I accumulated at 25 cents a share. I made a ton of money, but I would have lost it all. But my advisor told me, he said, Bob, you got to diversify. So, you know, it's, I don't care how good or smart you are at this. Everybody needs advice. You know, every, you know, why does Tiger Woods have a coach? Well, you know, he can't see his own swing. You know, you can't see your faults. You can't see, you know, what you don't, you don't know what you don't know. I think the, the price of advice is priceless in my opinion. And um, I'll tell you what's nice to have through these, these horrible periods. It's just somebody you can bounce ideas off and of knowing that someone's got your back and it's a lot easier. And I think that, um, you know, the proof's in the pudding. When you look at the, the statistics, Dalbar puts out these reports every year, average investor over 20 years made 2%. You know, with the average, uh, you know, advised portfolio made anywhere from five to 8%, depending on the risk. And it was just, um, you know, it makes a big difference. It really does. And I, and I think we made a big difference through this period. And, and, you know, I'm proud of my team. I'm proud of paying capital on uh, how we handled this one. And, you know, quite frankly, Ry, this one was the easiest, uh, you know, crash I've ever been through. <laughs> Believe it or not. In hindsight, Bob, but I think in March you want to say the same thing. Well, you know, I look, I, I added another layer of stomach, uh, you know, scar tissue to <laughs> my stomach lining. But frankly, quite yeah. frankly, um, I had more clients call us to see if it was an opportune time to add money than we did have people panicking. And we are the biggest we've ever been as a firm. So, you know, magnitude size larger. So, you know, I, I give great kudos to our clients. They're, they, they, they're educated and that's a bit, that's a good, a good sign of a good advisor is you're educated. Yeah, no, no, I agree with that hundred percent. And just for the record, I managed Bob's money at 2% because he was a high maintenance client. I am a high maintenance client. <laughs> so we just better put believe it. Bob's hair. We all do want Bob's hair. Um, and yeah, I, I'll just you know, speak to that real quickly too, before we wrap up here, almost 35 minutes, which is a good place to wrap up. Um, and look, we did these calls in March it was kind of scary because Bob and I are not epidemiologists. We didn't know how severe the pandemic was going to be. And you know, there's still some uncertainty around it now in all fairness. Um, and nobody really knew, right? But I think you're really the testament to what we're doing and what I think is really important is always having a discipline to follow. And the discipline told us this is when you add equities. Um, this is when you rebalance your portfolio and you take advantage of these dips. And you wouldn't do that if it was just based on the emotional uh, aspect of it, you know, based on what the news was saying and the unknown, but having a strategy for thick and thin, it saved our rears in many bear markets. Um, and this one's no exception. We've definitely learned some things as well. So I just think that, you know, look, we've got a strategy that you work with us. Uh, we're gonna continue to follow that. We get sharper and sharper. We've got great advisors who I'm so grateful for. They've executed magnificently. And, um, you know, anyone who's out there trying to figure out what they're trying to do, you got to get a strategy. That's it. It's, it's all about that discipline. And I think that's the key here. And that's what's going to keep us getting through. And as we look out to the future here, Bob, I know I speak for you when I say we're very, very optimistic. Uh, we see things rebounding a lot quicker than people think. And, uh, you know, we are definitely bullish on America, the economy, and what's to come. Yeah, I mean, if, um, you know, we're still doing tax swaps. Anywhere you have uh, an opportunity to put money in the lost bank, please do it. 
you know, we can offset some of the losses that, uh, you know, the market caused over the last couple of months and, and get the IRS to help us out with that, which I always like taking money from the IRS. And, you know, and we are, our portfolio is ex-dividend in a month, so we're going to have cash to, to reinvest. Let's buy low as always. And, um, hey, listen, we really appreciate all of you. We, we appreciate you tuning in tonight. Um, anything we didn't answer, you know, shoot us an email, give us a phone call. You know, we'll be back at it tomorrow. Uh, me at five, Ryan, probably around 10, 11. What do you time you usually get around noon? Yeah, around noon, you know, after uh, I have a couple of days <laughs> and, uh, you know, watch the morning shows. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah. Well, we'll be back at it early. Nose to the grindstone, you know, uh, on to the next day in the market. But uh, thank you everyone. We appreciate you all. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have a great night. And uh, we'll, this, we'll do this again sometime soon. If you find it valuable, we'll try to do more of these. So have a great night. And as always, we like to say, be bullish.